this is a parallel session 2a which is focusing on the social aspects and the social economic and governance are basically three topics that we touched upon we already listened and heard about our governance speakers now two parallel sessions on social and economic basically it, social is such a wide area it can cover a huge a variety of uh, topics and uh, we were kind of struggling how to narrow down and uh, what are the most pertinent things that uh, we can talk here and have discussion in context of tropical peatland restoration and uh, i'm very happy to share that we have three incredible speakers in this session and we will go through uh, one by one listen to them each of the speakers will share their presentation for 10 minutes and then we have a small discussion session uh, at the end Today, our first speaker will be Yuti Aryani. She is a postdoctoral researcher at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. She pursued her PhD from Endowin University of Technology, where she combined development studies and innovative science to understand socio-technical change in biofuel case. Currently, her research focuses on role of community participation in peatland restoration in Indonesia. Today, she will be sharing her insights on importance of strengthening local institutions to improve social cohesiveness. Social cohesiveness is a term we heard in our first session, so it's quite important when we talk about peatland restoration, and uh, UT is going to share more on that. So floor is yours, UT. Okay, thank you, Rupesh, for the introductions. And this is specially focused on, uh, on Sungai Tohor, so it's like a very small area in in Riau, um, but then like my research also focusing in, in Jambi in particular as well. Uh, so what I'm going to, to present here is mo uh, mostly like questioning what is like so social cohesiveness. And then basically uh, my, my argument is always like social cohesion is always like in struggle. It's always being contested. And the way I'm going to make this argument is uh, by doing like a longitudinal study. So I'm focusing um, in like uh, 20 years, no, 40 years time period. So, yeah, so uh, a bit of the background, why uh, studying uh, peatland is, is important. And because like many uh, other speakers already focus on this part, I will just like uh, skip uh, most of the part, but then I want to really uh, focus on the role of participation. So according to BRG and also like the governments, but also like other um, actors such as like NGOs and also like companies who's uh, involved in peatland restorations, they really see participation as like one key element, um, either like ethically, but also like functionally, because like if you're including uh, participations, then people are more willing to, to participate. Uh, so it's more like functional as well. Um, so, and also, as you see that like the participation approach already been adopted in the 1990. So it's also become like very important, but despite all these participations, uh, there are still many like challenges. It's either because of uh, the rewetting itself is not really um, going in line uh, with the economy. So because it's reduced like growth and productivity. And also there's like a mismatch between the design and the actual locations. And like from the, from my, case study as well in, in Sungai Tohar, there's also cases where the design of the uh, canal block uh, is kind of like um, limiting the trunk to transport. So there's always like a question uh, between like standardized uh, design uh, to prevent corruption. So one of the problems that is happening is um, to prevent corruptions, you have like a very uh, rigid uh, design uh, so what happened in the field, for instance, uh, they create the design based on what is being uh, requested by the BRG, but then after it's being handed over to the community, then they basically reconstruct it. So from a um, social point of view, that is not very effective um, because if they have the right or the voices to be included in a the process, they then can just like avoid this process. And also there's like a problem about the like absence of market as uh, Bumirna mentioned, for instance, uh, like there's Sekolah Lapang program and also there's a program to create like an alternative economy um, for the people 
uh, and especially this is happening uh, in the oil palm uh, villages where they have to compete uh, with specific crops and also like in an area where they're still kind of like burning activities. So what BRG uh, did um, was they create like a alternative economy. But what happened was they already like, usually like the woman being involved, uh, but there's no market for that. So there's like a problem for that as well. So uh, this is like the area of of my study. So Sungai Tohar is very special because like uh, the Indonesian president after uh, he's being elected in 2014, uh, this is the first place uh, that he visit. And like, uh, like from Singapore, it's very close because it only took like three hours from Batam. So um, this one is uh, specially selected. But what make uh, this case studies interested because it has like a long history of like uh, fight, um, fight between companies and the community. So it's not only like the Sungai Tohor, this part, um, but also like uh, Pulau Padang is also still in conflicts. Uh, and then there's like a, like other uh, area close to, to this um, particular area that is still a conflict with, with the company. So what I want to, to kind of like focus on this idea of like social cohesiveness is really about um, there's many actors that involve uh, in creating the social cohesiveness. So, uh, but then uh, there's always a process of grouping and regrouping between the actors. So what I, what I want to show is like in the 1980 until 2002, there are pe people really focusing on the economy. And then especially because uh, it's, a, it's quite like um, low income uh, village. So even like before the 80s, uh, they, they go outside the, the village uh, to another uh, island uh, to get uh, cultivate paddy. But then like during this period, there's a, like a supervisor coming at the national level, went to the village and then they, they promote like paddy cultivations. But once they, they tried uh, to cultivate paddy, then it didn't work. And then they start to shift to, to sagu. So this one happening, so this one is really like focusing on, on economy and uh, strengthening the Sagu network. So uh, the national governments also help uh, to promote uh, Sagu by giving like meals to the community. Uh, but then it's, it's start to change in 2002 when there's like a, a company entering the area. So in 2002, there's a company. So they, they got like concession from the national government. Uh, so what happened in 2002, they, they burned uh, the village head house because uh, the village um, had issued like a letter uh, stating that the, the company can get a uh, lock in, uh, from the area. And then uh, it's happened again in 2007 when the national governments issue like a concession for, for Petelum. Uh, so what happened was like they, they create the social cohesion by, by uh, collaborating with NGOs and also uh, create like a lot of campaign, um, including a national NGO as well. And, uh, and they, they, their resistance is really creating like a campaign and festivals and also uh, including uh, national artists uh, to, to, to make the, the voices uh, being heard at the national level. So uh, these social cohesions by, by creating like um, collaborations with different type of actors um, manage give them like the access to the land. So in 2016, uh, the, the national governments, the Ministry of uh, Enf Environment and Forestry, they issue like a letter and then ba basically uh, giving the concessions back uh, to the social forestry scheme. Um, and then uh, currently like the main issue is really about like sagu cultivation. So how the people over there uh, can um, can get their, their income from, from Sagu. But the problem is really because uh, at that moment, uh, in this moment, uh, there's only like one, one buyer. So they have like this dependency uh, on, on this um, particular buyer. So during the, the COVID situations, they have like one month when there's no buyer at all. So even uh, when there's no really problem uh, in this particular case between the ecology uh, and the economy because they already been uh, cultivating sagu in the 1980. Uh, but then there's like an economic problem because uh, there's only like depend on, on one, one buyer. So what happened was like they, they have uh, like collaborations with the ministry of, uh, of the corporations uh, and then they already managed to, to build this like huge factory uh, in, in Sungai Tohor. But uh, during COVID, at least like this year, and it, the, the national governments promised them to, to give like the operational costs. 
uh, to buy because like for instance this uh, particular uh, buyer they need like 1.2 uh, billion uh, rupiah per month to buy all the sagu in the community and then um, so if this uh, factory wants to run then at least they need like 2 billion to run the, the factory to buy and also to operate the factory so if we are talking about like social cohesion um, then it's really like questions like every uh, period they, they create like a new actors and then I reorganize the actors and what what happened is uh, what make them together what bind them together is really the interest so in this period like in the second period it's really about like contestations and struggles uh, against the national governments but then once uh, it's already being owned by the by the community and then the, and the issue is really about like how they manage to maintain the, the sagu procession so this is more like an illustrations on the local and non-local like uh, actors that's involved um, so uh, as you already heard like from the stories like the regulation is very important uh, and also like um, a relationship within the, the humans and the ecology uh, is also important so uh, like the people in Sungai Tohar they are very aware about how the how the ecology of, of the peatland and it's especially very clear during the, the Unisraya uh, presence in the area because they really uh, built like a huge canals which dry out their, their peatland uh, area and then because it's, it's drying up then uh, most of the sagu dying as well so as part of their um, like struggle or resistance they start to um, entering the concessions and then um, plan uh, their own sagu and, uh, and here basically like the, the national governments give uh, the concession back to the community through the social forestry uh, scheme. Um, so yeah, so regulation is important and also like different type of actors also enter. So in, in this period, it's quite interesting because there's uh, so many actors involved. You take one minute. Okay, yeah. So uh, in conclusion, I uh, want to say that social co cohesiveness is always contested. And also the type of like NGOs that's entered the area is also shifting. So in the second period is uh, is uh, like Walhi, but then in, in the latest uh, period is more like a, a different uh, NGO that's focusing really on um, on planting so pre uh, tree adoptions and also like festivals and also stabilization of social cohesion was done through constant resource mobilizations. Uh, so there's always need uh, work to be done. And transition in the social cohesion from one period to another uh, center around the relationship between the local community and sagu. So there's no uh, contestations between ecology and society um, and economy, and there's no contestation, yeah, economy and ecology, but vulnerability due to single market. Thank you, Rupesh. I give the floor back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, UT. It's very interesting uh, uh, presentation, and I myself is brimming with a lot of questions about like the scale cohesiveness between institutions across temporal scale, even at a small level. So it, it's a very complex, uh, I would say, uh, arena to try to, to understand it, but very interesting. We'll have more on the discussion. So uh, without taking more time, let's move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dianto Patriadi. Uh, he's a researcher at Agri Agrarian Resource Center at Pazajaran University in Bandung, Indonesia. He is an anthropologist by training and has public, published extensively on human rights issues. He holds a PhD from School of Politics and International Studies, Finders University Australia, and he has also served as deputy of Indonesian National Commission on Human Rights for External Affairs between 2013 and 14. So today he's going to speak on land tenure and conflict resolution by presenting a case study from West Kalimantan. Floor is yours, Tianto. Okay, thank you Rupes for the time and uh, thank you also to the organizer, especially C4 and BRG to invite me to speak here, to share my, my finding uh, on current research and also uh, small views based on this uh, research. Um, I would like to share uh, the screen to you all. Can you see now? Yes, perfect, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, this presentation is based on ongoing research in uh, West Kalimantan, uh, in uh, Sambas district, but now is interrupted by the pandemic. So uh, 
maybe I, I hope I can continue the field work uh, in this area. So the research is supported by Japan Institute, uh, Research Institute for Humanity and uh, Nature based in Kyoto. So uh, as we heard uh, much uh, from the previous uh, presentations, we know some uh, uh, petland areas in uh, West Kalimantan is targeted for the restorations. Uh, you can see the, the map uh, on the right side. And uh, Ibu Mirna already mentioned, so also there is a some, uh, there are some uh, program uh, conducted by BRG in Sambas area, especially in the six village in the Sekura sub district to the Desa Peduli uh, Gambut program. And several activities uh, conducted there, such as reweting, community organizing, uh, including the participatory mapping for the village border and the, the current uh, or the actual land use uh, by the local people uh, and etc. Uh, as well as the the initiative to resolve some uh, uh, disputes among the local people when they set up the village borders uh, mapping. And uh, we know also uh, in this area, uh, there is a Kuba, Kawasan Kuba Gambut Sambas uh, or the pit dome areas. Uh, and it's very interesting before the BRG work and the governments of Indonesia have a concern on the petland areas. The, all the areas in my uh, research sites actually is designated by the Ministry of Forestry as a production forest area. And then the concessions uh, uh, was provided by the Ministry to PT BMH to build the wood plantation or the HTE in that area. So can you imagine in the pit dome areas, there is a planning to build uh, wood plantations uh, owned by the private corporations. And then, because of several uh, political uh, uh, activities in the district, uh, the, in 2010, the local governments built a medium canals uh, on the west sides of the Sambas Petland areas to dry the area in order to develop local infrastructures, roads especially, and also to build more agricultural land for the local people. And part of this canal project is a long canal in Sarang Burung, uh, Kolam Village, which here, to the middle of the pit dome areas. And then it's cross the, the neighbors of village of uh, Lela here. Uh, and in fact, the canal had drained the Sambas petland area, including the deep pet swim or the pit dome. So now the pit land actually is almost dry in that uh, area or in this area. And uh, the long canal from Sarang Burung Kolam village to the Lela, to some part of the Lela village, is also generates attentions among the local people who live in these two villages, they are disputed about the border, the village border, the determination of the village borders uh, because of the uh, uh, BRG uh, program on the participatory uh, mapping. So in the, uh, 2014, a big fire occurred, occurred in this area, especially in the Middle West part of the Sambas uh, key at G or, or Kawasan Hydrology Gambut uh, mostly occurred in the ex working area of PT BMA or the, 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 the wood plant uh, concessions, the wood of plantation concessions. So, this is the background of the, the research. And here I provide uh, four maps that I uh, made by, and then my college made. Uh, through the uh, overlay mapping from uh, based on uh, based on uh, several uh, formal maps uh, provided by the authorities uh, and also the participatory mapping uh, conducted by the PRG. The first map is so the area of the 
the plan area for the PT uh, BS, B, BMH for the uh, uh, wood plant plantations. And this is the, the indicative map for social forestry provided by the uh, Ministry of Forestry. And also the indicative area for the TORA program. So this is the competitions among the authorities itself to implement the program, which is the social forestry or the TORA program. TORA is the land uh, object for the agrarian reform uh, program, uh, which is mean when the land uh, uh, designated as the TORA, then it should be released from the forestry area. And this is the actual, uh, the actual land use uh, in, in, in this uh, area. Uh, in the middle, the, the green, uh, the deep green is uh, the, the Kubah Gambut uh, area. And then uh, some sort of local people already used, actually already used uh, the land because it's uh, quite dry now. So this is the story of uh, long contestations uh, on the wetland and the forest uh, land use and functions in that uh, area. Uh, and then uh, the story continues. Yeah, the story continues. Uh, in 2009, uh, there is a, a militant uh, protest and also resistance from the local people that uh, led to the head of Sambas district or the Bupati revoke the, the wood plants, uh, wood plantations, concessions uh, that uh, provide to PT BMH. So the project, the HTA projects, uh, stop, uh, actually stop, and then uh, local people uh, now enter the areas, enter the areas, and then uh, open the areas. They use uh, to 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 grow the the rubbers uh, plants and and other plants. And interesting, uh, in 2018, under the assistance of the BRG local facilitators. A group of people in these uh, six villages submitted application for social forestry program yeah, to the Ministry of Forestry, either for village forest management or hutan desa or community forest or hutan kemasyarakatan. And uh, the last information I get uh, from a college in West Kalimantan said that in um, the mid in these years, uh, the ministry agreed to provide social forestry permits. Uh, I'm not already sure because I don't see the the document yet. So uh, the question is, is a social forestry become a resolution or the panacea or only a temporary solution for the contestation, for the land contestations and conflict uh, in that area, in the forestry and in that wetland area. However, <clears throat> however, before, before the ministry uh, released the permit for social forestry, the group of local farmers already created land management plots. So the land within the petland area, either located inside or outside the submitted social forestry areas, they already make a plan, a plot, a design to give to the member. And then for, for them, the schemes of social forestry look like as a win-win solution to really to resolve the land contestation and conflict over the forest area in Sambas. Meaning now they will have a, 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 a certainty to, to use and then to manage the area, which is the forestry area plus the petland area. Good and then by the end of 2019, Unfortunately, the BRG has ended its program in Sekura Subdistrict or in the six fillets of the, uh, the DPG program. So now the community with the new permit of social forestry has no partners to implement these new schemes to manage the forest, including the petland areas. And then the questions rise uh, in my mind in, in the recent is, could the PS be a sustainable program to support pet restoration or just open a new way of transformation of the petland areas with certain ecological functions into the non pet land function and purposes? That is the questions that I didn't, uh, I cannot answer yet, uh, but there is a two, uh, 
two uh, or the crossroads of of uh, the future uh, and the possibility in the futures uh, in that area. And then the question, uh, the second question is, uh, how will we as assist local people to implement the PS because BRG is not working there anymore, uh, and uh, PS uh, or, or uh, Perhutan and Social or Social Forestry uh, have uh, some kind of restriction, some kind of a requirement. And then, uh, in order to kind of sustainable forest management uh, by the local people, and then the last questions is uh, in case of Sambas Petan area due to the implementation of PS, why is only six villages in this east side of the Pitdom area? I mean, only six villages in this east side of Pitdom area provide a social forestry, while in the other area, especially in the west side of Pitdom area. We don't know the situation. I mean, uh, what kind of a scheme that governments provide or the NGOs or the local people want to manage uh, the forest, the pet land, and some of there are the pet dome areas. And uh, this is the question how to bring local people to involve in the rest Enter. of the time yep. is actually up. So can you quickly wrap up in less than yeah. a minute? So Concluding uh, slides, uh, Rupes. So one is a uh, conclusion is the petland restoration is the winding uh, process with uncertain results in my view, and especially in the dry, dry petland now uh, almost dry petland in that area in which uh, some areas have already used by local people and other for various purposes. The second is a careful designation on the targeted restoration program is necessary. And then the, the, the third is a creation of a criteria and indicator for sustainable restoration program should cover a remapping of the targeted areas geographically and socially. And the fourth is economic and social indicators so recognize the current use of pattern areas and touch any policy program implemented within the areas. And this criteria and indicator of petland restoration so encourage local people to involve in maintaining the petland restoration, but not to restrict much of their current social economic activities for livelihood. Otherwise, it will generate new local resistance or rejections. Uh, I think so all that I want uh, that I can share here, uh, Rupes, and thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Diento. So you actually posed a lot of questions that kind of share a snapshot of how how these these uh, landscapes and these areas are contested, how different programs from government can be, <clears throat> you know, uh, may not be consistent with each other. So yeah. just a tiny bit of time to have any questions or any discussion i know the the chat box was going on with a lot of questions and i know uh, some of the questions are already answered um just quickly if i can start by myself um because what is interesting when i i saw that that we all talked about a lot of complexity and this as uh, I'm from biophysical sciences, uh, where it's easy to go take a collect a sample and measure how much carbon and how much certain thing is there. But when you talk about social aspects, uh, the complexity of whether you, you talk it about the institutions between institutions, whether you talk at the village level, whether you talk, talk about provincial level, and when you uh, in our last presentation, Moy represented about the whole network of amongst people themselves within even a small village. So how do you to not only understand, but how the information flows, who makes the decision, how that decision is then accepted. These are very pertinent, very important aspects when you talk about peatland restoration, because these are living landscape, a lot of people, their livelihoods are dependent on it. And I think each, uh, I would say stakeholders, whether it's a government, non-government, with the private sector, non-state actors, they need to play their own part, uh, how to, have these goals which are identified, uh, how those are achieved in a most efficient manner, most effective manner, and what role governance, uh, governor, um, governance set up an institution can play. We are just trying to understand. I don't know what to say. I think these are all very important, very pertinent pieces, and more information is important. Uh, we need more data. We need more researchers. We need more uh, people going out and collecting this data. Um, is there any concluding thought by, let, let me give a uh, time, a couple of minutes left to our speakers, if they have anything else they wanted to add uh, that they couldn't cover in their presentation. 
anything just like a sentence or so. We have a minute and 15 seconds left before we will be moved back. So anything that uh, you want to say or any other panelists like Amy is here and any other member who wants to say something quickly. Well, no one is saying anything. So let me formally thank you uh, to our panelists for sharing their thoughts, their points definitely broadened our horizon, my horizon to think about these topics. And uh, just for the last uh, presentation, when Moira was talking about these network analysis, I was also thinking about the social network that we use today quite a lot with internet, you know, Facebooks and Instagrams and Twitter. And we are connected at, at a different level where a lot of information is exchanged. Uh, I think that is already happening at a small level, a small village level, when people are connected into the information exchange is happening through different channels. Maybe they didn't have a smartphone or internet before, but with your diagram, you're showing these, you know, with inward and outward and in between how information exchange was taking place and the important decisions are being made. And, and uh, of course, we can talk about whether they are fair, whether they are equitable, who benefits and whatnot that needs to be decided. But this is nice to see that the, the flow of information does take place and the, it's important to identify who are the movers and shakers, if you will. <laughs>